26 18 23 27 of the petition attached to defendant letter conveying the petition to his excellency the president of the republic of ghana are defamatory of the plaintiff sorry at law is seeking general damages for libel against defendant for publishing and all causing to be published the aforesaid words of and concurring in plaintiff the chairperson is also seeking an injunction restraining the defendant whether by himself his servants or agents or otherwise from authorizing permitting and or causing to be published the same or similar words defamatory of the plaintiffs it would be recalled that the aggrieved employees had petitioned the president to impeach Charlotte say over what he described as cronyism and financial malfeasance of the electoral commission they are believed to have made their petition through their lawyer We'll be delving deeper into that issue as we go on with the bulletin. Still on the Electoral Commission, the Alliance for Accountable Governance has called on the President to set up a Presidential Commission of Inquiry to investigate the allegations and counter-allegations by the Electoral Commission Chairperson Charlotte Hosse and her deputies. At a news conference in Accra, the group demanded that the Commission's Chairperson and her deputies, Amadou Sule and Georgina Opoku Amankwa, should step aside before the Commission work begins. The Electoral Commission Chairperson Charlotte Osei and two deputies, Amadou Sule and Georgina Opoku Amankwa, have made accusations and counter-accusations against each other. The accusations range from managerial incompetence, doubtful political neutrality to breaches of contract and public procurement act. The issue started with a call for impeachment of the Chairperson Charlotte Osei by a concerned group from the EC. According to the Alliance for Accountable Governance, President Ekufuado, as a matter of urgency, must establish a commission of inquiry to ascertain the truth or the otherwise of the allegations. The President has powers to commission an inquiry to ascertain the truth or otherwise of all issues that border on public interest. There is no doubt that this raging controversy at the Electoral Commission has generated huge public interest which requires a presidential commission of inquiry. The Electoral Commission Chairperson Charlotte Osei and two deputies Amadou Sule and Georgina Opoku Amankwa, the group insist, must step aside before the start of any investigation. It is appropriate for if the commission of inquiry will go into it, then you, can, you have to step aside so that complete deliberation and then the recommendation, if you are cleared, you are back. The Alliance for Accountable Governance also called for full state media coverage of the proceedings of the proposed Commission of Inquiry. The group, however, wants government to draft the terms of reference as well as some sort of immunities to witness who may testify before the Commission. All right, let's still stay uh, the same on this particular issue because uh, it is of great worry. William Nyako is the executive director of the Africa Center for International Law and Accountability. He joins us in studio this evening. I thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to have this in two ways. Now, you've seen the suit by Charlotte Tose suing the lawyer for the petitioners. Now, she had already come out to respond to these allegations which are contained in the petition submitted to the president, which they have acknowledged receipt. Does her response to this and this suit uh, really negate the process in any way? Well, first of all, everybody has a right to defend themselves and to protect their name. And so uh, from the preliminary standpoint, um, it's, it's an order. However, you have a petition which is before the president, and the petition has invoked Article 146, which actually provides um, the guidelines for removal of you know, a justice of the Superior Court, mm -hmm. and she's equivalent to a justice of the Superior Court. So I'm not quite sure that this is a good strategy uh, to be fighting the petitioners uh, outside of the, the process which has been laid down by the Constitution. And indeed, one of the things she's seeking is for those petitioners to actually be named, because she described us, them as an amorphous group of persons who say they are concerned staff of the Electoral Commission. So that's the absence of the identities of the petitioners negate or affect this process in any way. So what the he he are split on this. The first point is whether uh, in submitting the petition to the, uh, to the president, 
whether all the petitioners had to be named. They had a lawyer. But when it gets to the point where the president refers the matter to the chief justice as required by Article 146, all the petitioners, you know, the identity cannot be uh, uh, withheld. And I'm sure that the lawyers for the petitioners at some point uh, had been contemplating that at some point the names of all the petitioners uh, would be revealed. Whether if the chief justice finds a prima facie case that it should go forward, whether that uh, the non-disclosure of the names earlier on during the filing of the petition, whether that will play into it, uh, it's, it's something that remains to be known. But at least I've also heard uh, that there's been subsequent uh, additional information which have been sent to the office of the president where the names of the petitioners have been disclosed. So um, I think this is, this is a very, uh, very interesting uh, case that is going to be developing over time. We know that in the case of Justice Derry versus Anas, the Supreme Court said a petitioner had to be known. Absolutely. Your, your name has to be disclosed. Um, this goes through a different set of, uh, of rounds before it gets to uh, um, the, the, the committee which will be set up by the Chief Justice if the Chief Justice finds a prima facie case to take it forward. Okay. Now, but, and so I just want to uh, get to this point so that we both are on, on the same page. Okay. So this whole process triggers a constitutional process. Okay. Does the suing of one person, or can one person be charged for triggering a constitutional process as against what was the case in the Nazis case? Because these are two different scenarios. They are two different okay. scenarios. So can one person, I mean, in this case, the lawyer for the petitioners is actually being sued. Can one person be charged for triggering this constitutional process, as is the case? So uh, there's a little bit of distinction also because the lawyer is not a petitioner. The lawyer is acting on behalf of the petitioners. But since he was the one acting on behalf of the petitioners and there had been some back and forth between the lawyer and the EC uh, uh, chairperson uh, about not disclosing the identity and that he's willing to take the matters to court, I think the chairperson's lawyers have taken uh, this route. Uh, but this is not your normal case where there's a publication in the media or a publication has got into a third person and therefore you can go straight ahead and sue. Uh, the person uh, for defamation. This has triggered a constitutional process uh, which requires that the petition is sent to the office of the president, whereas the office of the president has the petition, which you know, the law says that he shall refer the petition to the chief justice. I see. Uh, but I, I do not think that uh, it's a good strategy to adopt this part. Like I said, she has a right to her, uh, protect her name. I get the point. You've spoken to the legal aspects of it, which you I respect the fact that you are a lawyer in that respect. But your organization as well has been dealing with the Electoral Commission for quite a while with uh, developing capacity uh, building programs for them. Now, how is all of this affecting the democratic credentials of us as a country in the eyes of the international community, which you have also been, been working with? So, I mean, it's, no matter how you look at it, it is really a regrettable uh, situation that we have because this one electoral commission uh, seemed to be the only democracy, the only institution that we had which had not been tended mm -hmm. until now. You remember Shraj had his own time um, mm -hmm. with a former commissioner. Uh, Parliament also came under fire for alleged bribery. Judiciary had been investigated for uh, bribery and things like that. So um, the Electoral Commission uh, was the only institution that seemed not to have been tainted by you know, such uh, scandals. So it is really regrettable, but this is a democracy. And that when things happen in the way that they have happened, we have a process by which all these issues will be outlined and then uh, the due process, the rule of law will be followed. Electoral Commission is a very important institution. Absolutely. This is where the, the consent of the government is taken from uh, when we go and cast ballots. Uh, so it is important that uh, no matter how unfortunate the situation is, the due process of law must be followed. And I've heard people say that the commissioners or the commissioners should step aside. Absolutely. And this is what the Alliance for Accountable Governance, the story we just played, and some other groups and persons are calling for. I mean, this is unprecedented. Very damning debacle we are seeing now. Okay. The three have clearly demonstrated they cannot work together. I mean, after everything is said and done, 
Should we see them still being there as commissioners after demonstrating this deep-seated level of disagreement? I mean, is it healthy for us? Well, from a policy standpoint, typically if somebody is under investigation, as uh, the events are unfolding, the person would step aside. But we are looking at specific provisions of the law under Article 146, um, which says that the petition should actually not be made public. And then the, when the Chief Justice finds the prima facie case, then it will form a five-member committee of three uh, justices of the Superior Court and two non-lawyers. And they will hold uh, their inquiry in camera. So none of this was supposed to have been in the public domain. And Article 146 does not contemplate that when a person is being investigated in this manner, that they should step aside. Indeed, after the committee has mm. done its work, it's so to submit it to the Chief Justice, then the Chief Justice will forward it to right. the President. You know, so due process on both okay. sides are supposed to be followed. And I can understand that, that some would want that uh, they should step aside, but Article 146 that, does not contemplate that. They can take, they can take uh, personal decisions and say because of the investigation, if it gets to that point, right. then I will step aside. But uh, the, the, the rule of law under Article 146, which triggers the impeachment and removal, suspension uh, proceedings, do not In this case, time is of the essence, but the wheels of justice grind slowly sometimes, and then it has to be sped up. But I thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful for your time. William Nyako is the Executive Director of the Africa Center for International Law and Accountability. ASILA, they've worked closely with the Electoral Commission for so many, many, many years now, helping the commission in various aspects of capacity building away from that. The minority in parliament has condemned the raiding of the private residence of Member of Parliament for the Peru East constituency, Dr. Kormina Donko, by the security agencies. The minority considers it as unacceptable as it impedes the work of sitting members of parliament, saying it amounts to contempt of parliament under Article 122 of the 1992 Constitution. The minority in a statement said the search and the subsequent seizure of Governor Don Cos laptop and other media of communication is shameful and sad in a country that upholds the rights of its citizens to privacy. It said the matter is even more troubling as the member of parliament was not informed until he was shown the court order that he is a suspect in an investigation. The statement signed by the minority leader said the act is a breach of privilege, undermines the ability of the member of parliament to perform his legitimate duties and by extension negates the work of parliament. The statement added the invasion of the MP's residence signals the era of a calculated program to harass and intimidate vociferous members of the minority and stifle the progress of democratic processes. So as the minority of parliament is saying that it is in fact illegal and a breach, we are asking ourselves what the constitution says on this matter. Now, the constitution on immunity and privileges is art Article 122, General Contempt. It spells out that an act or omission which obstructs or impedes Parliament in the performance of its functions or which obstructs or impedes a member or officer of Parliament in the discharge of his duties or affronts the dignity of Parliament or which tends either directly or indirectly to produce that result. It's is contempt of parliament and this is the act article that the minority is referring to saying that it has been breached but we're further asking ourselves what the constitution actually spells out and the security it provides mps whether they are at, at home or on their way to the to their place of office or returning home now it says in article 117 immunity from service or of process and arrest civil or criminal process coming from any court or place out of Parliament shall not be served on or executed in relation to the Speaker or a member or the clerk to Parliament while he is on his way to attending at or returning from any proceedings of Parliament. This refers to him, the member of Parliament being on his way to or returning to an engagement of Parliament. However, in the case of Kwabena Donko, he was at home when this situation in fact ha happened and it's clear that the constitution is silent on this issue and that's what we're probing a bit further Alfred. Exactly, you know, uh, 
Uh, That's where uh, the minority also weighs in to say that uh, uh, Kwame Nadonko's office was on the 10th floor of the Job 600 building, which was gutted by fire sometime last week. And so he's been working from home yeah. on his parliament and with his pen drives that have been taken. So, yes, if his laptop was taken, then it's an obstruction of the work of of a member of parliament because he's working absolutely, absolutely uh, from his laptop mm -hmm. because his office has been closed as a result of that fire outbreak. It's something yeah, it's that a, clearly... It's interesting counter-attack there, but... It's going to pan out. But the police is saying that they acted within the laws by searching the house of the former energy minister, Dr. Kobna Donko, director general of the Ghana Police and Public Affairs Department, ACP David Iklu, is insisting there is no law that bars a member of parliament from being investigated in criminal matters, adding they followed every due process in carrying out the mandate. The former energy minister, Dr. Kobna Donko, was in the early hours of Monday, July 24, searched by the police in relation to the ongoing investigations into the Ameri deal. The police action generated public uproar with a section of accusing the police of violations. But the Director General of Police Public Affairs Department, ACP David Yuklu, says their action was in accordance with the law. There are procedures in investigation, especially in terms of search warrants. So you have to go and apply to the court and give reasons why you want to issue, uh, you, want, you want a search warrant. That is authority for you to enter somebody's premises or any other place to search for evidence in relation to a case that is considered to be criminal. Yes, we are exercising our mandate. And it is a process of investigations. Certain actions that you take in terms of investigations must necessarily get the, the endorsement from the courts. If you want to conduct a search, either a senior police of a certain rank or you go to court to justify the reason why you need to enter somebody's private premises to look for information. He disagreed with suggestions parliamentarians cannot be investigated. There's no warrant that is granted generally to go and look for anything. The items that you're looking for are specified and the warrant is shown to the person who is under investigation and we tell them what we do in terms of execution, executing the warrant. There's no law saying that an MP or a sitting MP cannot be questioned when it comes to criminal incidents. So we went to court and explained our case that there's a need to clear the air about this issue lingering in the public domain. And the court granted it that yes, you can go ahead and conduct a search. That's what we did. ACP David Clue said items to be searched were listed by the court, adding that they will go at any length in carrying out their mandate. We'll certainly probe that issue further subsequently to bring clarity on it. But away from that, an Accra High Court has ordered the confiscation and sale of convicted drug trafficker Nayele Ametefe's mansion at East Legon worth $1.6 million and the revenue distributed to state institutions. The court ruled that Nayele, who's serving an eight-year jail sentence in the United Kingdom, had two mansions, one at East Legon and the other at Kumasi in the Ashanti region. The state, according to the judge, could only prove that the East Legon property belonged to the convict, but not the one situated in Kumasi, hence only the one in Accra should be sold. Justice George Namensa Dacha, who delivered the judgment, said the evidence from the state prosecutors could not prove the ownership of the Kumasi property. The court gave the breakdown of how the revenue from the property sale should be distributed. 50% to the Narcotics Control Board, 20% to Economic and Organized Crime Office, 15% to the Judicial Service of Ghana, and 15% to the Consolidated Fund. Section 66 of Act 804 of the Economic and Organized Crime Office Act 2010 provides legal backing for the sharing of the revenue accrued from the sale of the confiscated property. In June this year, several movable property belonging to Nayeli were confiscated and distributed to rehabilitation homes and related institutions. Let's just stay with the courts. And a cry high court has ordered publishers of the Daily Post newspaper and its editors, Michael Dokosi, to pay an amount of 800,000 Ghana cities to Hakman Ousu Ajiman. The Cocoa Board Board Chairman, Hakman Osojiman, is also to get 800,000 cities as damages for defamatory publication against him. The court, in his judgment, asked the defendants to, within two weeks, retract the defamatory story and apologize on the front page of the paper. 
the former minister of state Hakman Wusu Ajman, filed a 5 million CD suit against draft publications, publishers of the Daily Post newspaper and the editor Michael Dokosi and one Haruna Mahama for defamation. Dokosi and Mahama Haruna alleged that Hakman Wusu Ajman recorded and leaked a tape of a secret meeting between former president John Kufo, some members of the clergy and some party elders. He was accused by Mahama Haruna of recording the meeting and leaking the story to embarrass former president and the clergy. Among the claims by Hakman Wusu Ajman were damage for libel in the sum of 5 million cities and an order of perpetual injunction to restrain the defendants, whether by themselves, their agents, servants, workmen, privies, or any of them, or otherwise, from further writing, printing, publishing, and or causing to be written, printed, and published the said ways or similar statements defamatory of the plaintiff. Still watching News 360 here, streaming live on 3news.com as well as TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Let's take a look at how. A very good evening to you and a warm welcome to the business news here on News 360. My name is Park Kwisio Sari. Uh, let's begin with our very first uh, subject for the day and the fourth session of the Ghana Togo Permanent Joint Commission for Cooperation has opened in Accra. In an address, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Charles Oredu, called for the implementation of the final communique signed during the third session. The relations between Ghana and Togo dates back to 1968 when both countries signed an air transport agreement followed by the signing of a health agreement in 1973. Three sessions have since been convened, with the last two in 1992 and 2009. In May 2017, President Akufuado and the President of Togo expressed the desire of their government to work on the cooperation between the two countries. Speaking at the fourth session of the Ghana-Togo Permanent Joint Commission, the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister, Charles Oredu, called for implementation of the third session agreement. I wish to call on our experts to engage in the evaluation of the level of implementation of the decisions taken during the third session and existing memoranda of understanding to guide them on the way forward. Even as we deliberate and discuss new areas to establish mutually advantageous cooperation between our two countries. Head of the Togo delegation, Abrate, wants Ghana and Togo's relation on security revisited. Some commitment that has been taken by the two sides, which actually begins to be carried out, like uh, Togakope water drinking uh, project and the Mwepe juxtaposition border control. And we would like to see how far we have gone in this. More so, our relations on, on securities between the two countries uh, needs to be revitalized and to be revisited. The Joint Commission, which serves as a framework for deliberation on bilateral relations between the two countries, has been inactive since its last session in March 1992. So we're going to stay with developments from the Monetary Policy Committee meetings, uh, which ended uh, with a resolution to reduce the policy rate uh, by 150 basis points to 21%. There have been reactions uh, coming in from that. Uh, one of the uh, issues that came out was about Ghana's total uh, debt, that's the public debt, which currently stands at 137.2 billion cities as of May this year, uh, putting the debt-to-GDP ratio at 67.5%. Well, the debt stock increased by over 9 billion cities in just three months. Uh, the head of the Department for Finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Dr. Uh, Godfred Bokbin, says Ghana will have to expand its economy to deal with the situation. Once your debt is rising and your economy is not expanding, you are exposed. It may signal government's intention to hike taxes in the future because it has to be paid for in one way or the other. So there's a, a compelling reason to manage your debt. And the most effective way of managing your debt is actually to grow your economy. 
In the first quarter of this year, government has raised 17.4 billion cities, while 22.2 billion cities was raised in the second quarter. For the last six months, government's approach to the public debt has been more of debt profiling. This strategy involves the use of medium to long-term loans, which are cheaper to retire already existing short-term debts that have reached their maturity. Close to 75% of government's borrowing this year has been used to pay off short-term debts. Professor Bokping indicated the approach by government is to find the necessary fiscal space to maneuver. We are taking longer uh, uh, dated uh, debts or bonds, less expensive, to retire short dated bonds that were probably issued at slightly uh, higher cost. So that is what we are doing. Once we do that also, that will also free up some space for the government to be able to prioritize some developmental activities within the space that has been created. Professor Bokpen believes the economy is not resilient but quickly added stabilization of commodity prices on the world market gives Ghana some comfort. He explained government has to spend to stimulate economic growth for the private sector to strive. While arguing government to take a look at other debt sustainability ratios aside debt to GDP ratio. There are other indicators like debt service to revenue ratio. And then, so when you look at debt service to revenue ratio, our performance is above the policy dependency threshold. Once you spend more than a third of your total tax revenue to service your debt, that is, that is, that is uh, way um, uh, unsustainable. Professor Bokping was convinced once government's policies begin to yield fruits, the debt to GDP ratio will improve. All right, so away from the economy, let's find out what's been happening in the extractive industry. And the Minister of Land and Natural Resources, John Peter Amewu, has hinted of plans to review the lease of small-scale miners in the country at the end of the six months uh, temporary ban. While well, this is to enable the government to achieve its aim of san sanitizing the system as part of plans to revamp the mining sector. Despite government's six months ban on all small scale mining activities in the country, recent reports clearly shows the activity is still ongoing. This month alone, close to 20 illegal miners at Nsuta, a gold mining community in the Pristiahuni Valley district of the western region, died when they got trapped in a pit. The latest of such cases is at Patriensa in the Asante Achim Central District of the Ashanti region, where at least two people have been confirmed dead, with 11 others trapped in a mining pit. We haven't got there yet. I say there's a lot more to be done. You know, I can put a success rate of almost about it. We are not even up to 30% what we have done. I'm not totally satisfied, but I think the involvement of Ghanaians and the direction given by the president give me hope that we should be able to address this within the period of five years that we put it out. Several interventions have been implemented since the inception of small-scale mining in the country in 1989, but it appears the expected result is yet to be achieved. One of such was for the Minerals Commission to facilitate the licensing and monitoring of small-scale mining activities. In April this year, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, John Peter Amewu, asked that all nine district officers under the Minerals Commission proceed on leave for their negligence. We constitute a committee. Uh, the committee, you know, looks into their issue. They've submitted a report. The report is on my table. Uh, some of the recommendations, of course, will be looked at, and some, of course, it's not mandatory that we accept the, all the recommendations. So we are, you know, also reviewing the recommendations from the committee. Immediately we finish, we will let the country know. A government five-year multilateral mining integrated project will train some youth to take charge of the mining areas. The minister reviewed permits of most small-scale miners would have to be reviewed. I can s tell you for sure that most of the mining lists that are given to the small scale, a lot of them are going to be reviewed. At the end of the ban or the suspension, we are just not going to say go back to them. No, 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 no. You have to go through a process and that process will mandate you 
to go back to the, your mining area. It is left with about two months for the six-month ban to come to an end. Well, that's all for the very latest in the world of business. Thanks for watching. My name is Park Kwesi Asari. For more news, log on to our website, 3news.com. Thanks, Park Kwesi, for all the business news there. Away from business, one person is feared dead following a downpour in the Tamale metropolis, which lasted some two hours. 30 others, including children and school pupils, narrowly escaped death. The rain swept through parts of the metropolis, including Sanergo district, causing major havoc. Vehicle of the dead woman was swept away, including other persons who attempted driving through the rushing water. The body has been handed over to the Northern Regional Police Command for investigation. Officers of the Ghana National Fire Service who were on a rescue mission at the scene rescued a total of 30 persons, including school pupils. Affected areas include the gynecology unit of the Tamaletician Hospital, Kuku, Jisunayili, Kunya Villa, and Gumbene. Meanwhile, some children were seen fishing. Another worrying situation there. You're still watching News 360.